IT people and our ADCOM people and our, our division administration for all the support they provided in uh, us putting this series together on that. And, uh, and again, this series has been, been recorded. Uh, Bronson has started it now. Thank you, Bronson. I didn't think to tell you to start recording. But the series is being recorded, and Dr. Taylor will send me, and he may put it in the chat box today, a link to the site that we'll be able to go to and listen to all of the recordings uh, from this field tour. And then if I get any handouts from the presenters, we'll post all those handouts over there on the, in that site as well. Now, but we have created a site uh, that uh, everybody will be able to go to. And for those that did attend and registered for the meeting, I'll email that out to everybody. So you'll be able to, excuse me, and find that site uh, in the future where, again, all the recordings and, and, and uh, both this meeting um, and the free recordings will be there posted for you. So I think with that, um, everybody, you've probably been brought in and mute. We don't have a large crowd. So I think if you unmute and ask a question, we'll be just fine. If you just want to ask a question via chat, that's fine. Put it in the chat box uh, between Aaron, Mike, and I. We'll kind of we'll keep check on that as well. But with that, Aaron, I'll turn it over to you and let us uh, let you get us cranking. Gary, I don't know if there's much more to say there other than just welcome and we appreciate everybody being here. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, um, start out with a, um, a video, um, Bronson, and uh, and we'll start out. I believe it's Josh's video. Is that correct? So uh, we'll do that and follow up, and Josh will be on here to uh, be able to answer any questions and go through it afterwards. Josh is going to actually prevent uh, present a little bit at first. Yeah, we'll we'll go through a little bit of. Uh... A little bit of uh, stuff, and then we'll we'll go to the video. So. All right. So, uh, well, I, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity for for Gary. You know, kind of putting this together. Very unique times call for for unique experiences, and I think every time we do one of these, it is it is fairly unique. Um, when we first kind of started talking about this, Gary uh, gave me the, the general concept of just talk sorghum. I thought eventually on down the line, he'd give me a little bit more on just talking sorghum, but I think he's hold, held to the just talk sorghum uh, on this. And, and I think it's a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good idea. Me and him have gone back and forth on kind of what, uh, what to talk about on this, but uh, we wanted to hit on a couple of different topics, talk a little bit about what we do down in Southwest Oklahoma as far as sorghum stuff, uh, and then talk about some of the very detailed uh, items that we're looking at down in the region. Um, so uh, I, I added Gary there because um, without without Gary and Mike and, and those guys down there, really most of this can't be done. Uh, it's such a such a drive for us uh, to get down there to do day to day activities. So we really appreciate Mike, uh, formerly Emily, and and Gary for for helping us out this year and, and previous years as well. So. Just talking a little bit, uh, Tipton, not Altus, is actually one of the hosts for um, our, our sorghum variety or sorghum performance trials that we've had for a number of years. And, and, uh, sorghum, or, and Tipton's been in that location for, for quite a number of years. Um, and kind of every, every year we start off looking at the performance trials, we look at each individual locations and we, we ask ourselves the question of, well, why do we have a trial there and is it still worth the investment and time and effort to keep that trial there. Um, and for Tipton, the answer is, is consistently been yes for a couple of reasons. One, it's a very historic site. We've had that, like I said, for a number of years um, since, since I, it, Rick Kokenauer ran trials and, and maybe even before Rick was down there, we ran trials in Tipton. Um, but, but the reason why we always keep it is, is I always say it provides us with that unique, true Southwest Oklahoma location. And we, we maybe should redefine what we're calling a true Southwest location. Um, you know, we do have other trials in the Southwest area. Uh, namely, we've had Chickasha for a number of years. And if you look at it, it is in the Southwest, which we distinguish, you know, west of I-35, south of I-40. Um, however, Tipton location is, is kind of what we would consider that stereotypical sorghum ground in Southwest. It, it, uh, 
And chickasha is on those, those river bottom soils. So it's those deep soils that are less drought prone and serious uh, like heat and, and uh, lack of rainfall periods. And Tipton just doesn't have that. It's, it's more your, your typical sands, um, sandy, sandy, uh, silty soils, sandy loam, stuff, stuff like that. So we do have some, some, you know, more consistent Southwest Oklahoma soils down there. They do go a little dry, which is very typical of what our sorghum growers will experience down there. And so it's, it's a great, it's a great spot to actually provide growers with you know, information on, on how it will respond in those really hot, really potentially dry situations. The other thing that is not maybe good for growers down there, but it's great for our work is it is often the entrance point for aphids in the state. Uh, we, we will typically pick up aphids around that Tipton area as, as the first spot we pick it up pretty early in the season if we're going to have them. Um, so it's a great evaluation of a lot of our resistant varieties, as well as how our sorghum responds, even when we do manage it, because we do manage for aphids, how that sorghum responds in season. So that's kind of why we do Tipton, and, and I think it's a great location for, for a, a vast array uh, of, of reasons. So Gary, Gary told me, you know, you might have to answer the question, what's the best hybrid down in that region? Well, if you know me and you've heard a talk that I've given on variety stuff, I, I, I think that there's not a clear cut answer on what the best variety. One, because I know just like most growers have a favorite color of paint they have on the tractor, they have a favorite color and design bag that they like to get their seed from. The good thing is all of our companies, especially down in Southwest Oklahoma, because there's a lot of our companies that are, are making hybrids for that Southwest Oklahoma region. Um, most of our companies have really good hybrids that fit that area. Um, the other thing is I think, I think that Southwest region, particularly that far Southwest region is it's, it's a, it's a feast or famine situation. So it's not necessarily, we need to find the hybrid that will will potentially be top one or two in any given year. We we want to find that hybrid down in southwest Oklahoma that won't be bottom five, bottom ten, and and, and it's more a consistent kind of some of those workhorse varieties that that kind of are down there. So when we look at what's the best variety for sorghum, best hybrid, it's it's something that we can start to do because there's not a lot of big turnover. We, we look at soybean and corn and we see those turnover every year or two. We are getting a little more turnover because we are getting some more advanced genetics in sorghum, particularly when we talk about herbicide resistance or herbicide tolerance. Um, however, whenever I look at a, a sorghum hybrid, uh, other things besides yield kind of come into my mind. Um, talking about maturity, what maturity fits best with your production system. Um, whether it's a big tiller or if it's a single stem variety, does it have resistance to things like fusarium, charcoal rot, aphids, green bug, what have you. One that often, we, we were just talking about birds before we got on here, what the head size and the head spread is. Um, we take a look at these, these three varieties uh, on the right hand side and we'll talk a little bit about them in a little bit more detail, but you can tell just by the pictures that the, the spread or the closed or openness of that sorghum head is quite different based on those individual varieties. So um, we have the potential to look at something like that. The other thing that we'll kind of stress here in a couple of minutes are the germination potential. Does it do well in cold soil germination? Uh, does it do well in warm soil germination? We've looked at cold seed germination for a number of years. Um, specifically with can it go below, below that 60 degree Fahrenheit soil temperature, which is where we kind of push sorghum into a happy medium for, for growing and getting good emergence. There, there are hybrids that will be planted in 58, 55, even 53 degree soil temperature and do just fine. Uh, they'll, they're germinate and they'll grow like they're in 60. Some will just sit there in the soil and wait until we get good 60 degree soil temperature. So it's something to kind of look at. So we did, we do have a demonstration out there in Altus. And if you're watching this video uh, or, or you're here today and, and you, you're in the area and you want to take a look at it, it's, it's a couple of demonstrations. It's very late. Uh, we're planted much later than we typically do in this region. Um, however, I, th I think this year was actually okay for that late planting. 
Um, we kind of surpassed some of those really stressful events in more vegetative stages. So we got to take advantage of some of these, these fall or late summer, early fall rainfall events, some of the cooler temperatures, still some really good uh, growing conditions for sorghum. If we have enough days to finish out, I think, well, and the birds will stay out of it, I, I think we'll have some good yields here. Um, but we look at uh, something like this, this uh, M60 GB31, this is a Dynagro hybrid. Um, it's, it's actually one of, that we consider our early. It's in our early standpoint, and, but it's just barely in our earlies. We do earlies anything less than 60 days to mid bloom. Our mediums are 60 to 70 days to mid bloom. And then our lates are anything greater than 70 days to mid bloom. This, this uh, M60, because of the number there is 60 days to mid bloom. It's, it's actually right on that border. We threw it in with the, with the earlies because in a, in a lot of our Oklahoma systems, it'll actually act like it's a 59 or 58 day to mid bloom hybrid. So it is kind of falling in our region into that uh, more of that, that early variety. So we, we can kind of get in get some good vegetative growth, get into reproductive growth, and potentially finish out fairly early with uh, a variety like this. Um, we see that it's actually considered a, a semi-open variety. If you look at that panicle type, we see that it, it's kind of starting to branch out and spread out as it opens up and it goes through flowering. It may branch out a little bit more when we get grain filling in there. And I think when this picture was taken, we were about mid grain fill on that. And so it does have that potential to kind of branch out and, and kind of get a little more open of, of a panicle. Um, good standability. It is kind of short. It is on the shorter side, but most of our earlies uh, do have a, a little bit of shortness to them. It's one that has good top end yield potential. It, it definitely is one that you don't want to plant light though. Uh, the tillering potential is, is pretty, uh, I don't want to say is low, but it's less than some of the other varieties we evaluate for this region. So if we do look at it, especially when we look at it at a more narrower spacing, we need to make sure we put enough seed out there or else we're just not gonna fill that ground up. And with sorghum, you wanna fill that ground up to make sure you're getting good weed control uh, in those centers. And you, you see here, it, they're, they're on, uh, Gary, I can't remember if they're on 30s or 36s, really wide rows um, and, and we're not lapped canopies here. Once again, this is later planted, but it's, it's, it's rarely going to get a very early uh, uh, canopy closure on something like that. So short, nice, good head spacing, open head will we'll fill out. And uh, I'm just looking at the sheet and it's, uh, they, they say, once again, it's about 98 days. So about 100 days to relative maturity. So good short, short hybrid if we want to get in and out, maybe go back to wheat uh, in, in that system. DKS 3607 is one that we, we have in here, and it's, it's a, a medium early. We actually went back and forth on if this should have been 3707, and, and if, it, if you're familiar with 3707, it looks scarily like 3707. This is actually a new one they've put out, looking at uh, trying to update 3707. That's a very historic variety we've had for a number of years. Starting to lose that top end yield potential. I still think it's got a lot of go on it though. This is kind of their answer to kind of get that top end still again. They call this one uh, about a, if, if I do, let me check just to make sure, uh, days to mid bloom 62. So it's a little earlier than 3707. I would say in our conditions that, that at least some of the stuff that I've seen on, on this looking through things, it's, it's probably a little longer than that in our soils and our, our growing systems, but, but that's probably fairly accurate. So it's on that medium, medium early variety. They call this also a, a, a semi open or a partial open. I, I would kind of venture to say this is more a compact head, probably a semi compact head. It's, it's a lot tighter in there than the, the GB31 we have above. Um, nice good head spacing for as tall as it is. That's, that's one thing, usually when you get a little taller, the heads start to space themselves out a little bit. Nice good head spacing in there, uh, good variety, good head exertion. So if you wanna get that combine uh, above those flag leaves, but still get that head, you got a good situation there. Good standability, nice compact, got some good stay green to it. So good hybrid, good response. We haven't seen it still take on the, benefits that 3707 has has done it's it it kind of competes with yields 
across the state. I, I haven't seen it kind of out compete yield on 3707, but we're not really getting the yield draw off that 3707 that some of the other states in the sorghum growing region have been. I threw in this other one, this Advanta one, because I wanted to highlight a couple of things. It is, it is an experimental, and we're probably a year or two off this becoming commercial, but I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things. One, this is what we would consider a more open head type. Very, very flaring head type. It's got a lot of open branches in there. This is a late, this is a 73 day to mid bloom. Probably with as late as we plant it, we probably probably get some benefit out of planting this late if the, the weather cooperates with us, but it might be a little too late going at 73 days. Big open head, still doing a lot of flowering. It's tall. This has almost got a little bit of forage sorghum left in it. You can kind of look at that by the spacing of the leaves. It's not a big cluster of leaves down there in an exerted head. It almost looks like a forage sorghum that not great head exertion on top of a lot of clusters of leaves. It's tall. It doesn't have really good even head spacing. Um, this is a variety that actually is not well suited for that, that Tipton area. This is a great hybrid when we get it up into really, uh, really, really high yield potential northern Oklahoma systems and irrigated panhandle was where this, this variety was, was kind of made. So once again, sometimes we aren't looking for that variety that fits into that system with these trials. Sometimes we are looking at the variety that doesn't fit into that system. And, and those, those are almost just as important as the ones that, that are great fit is the ones that aren't great fits to that system. So once again, going off of that, what's my best yielder? And, and I wanted to take a little bit of a look. This is some of the information that you can find on the sorghum performance trials that's available on the, the um, extension website. Um, this was 2019, a great year, averaging about 5,000 pounds between the earlies and the lates. I didn't, or sorry, the earlies and the mediums. I didn't add the lates in in 2019 because whenever you look at our 2020, we actually weren't able to harvest the lates. They never really made it out of boot and filled grain. So we were a little bit lower this year, high stress, especially during that, that reproductive growth period that our earlies and our mediums were able to get out of. The lates just weren't able to, to get out of them. So what I wanted to highlight here is, is looking at um, the, the yield response of a couple of our hybrids between these two years. And so what I wanted to do is compare between 2019, which is again on the left, uh, good yield potential 5,000 pounds on the earlies, and then our early hybrids from the Tipton location in 2020 here. Um, so I've circled three of these, these hybrids. The one that I circled in, in yellow, Sorghum Partners 31A15. If we look down at the bottom of the graph, we see this is our, our, our trial average for this particular maturity group. We see about 5,000 pounds. This Sorghum Partners 31A15 was below average uh, in 2019. Uh, still really nice yield, but, but was a couple hundred pounds below the average. Um, still, still fairly nice, but we had some really nice varieties that are competing with it in that year. If we look at that same sorghum partners in 2020 to the graph on the left, it's, it's 4,800 pounds when the average is just under 4,000. So quite a bit above average. Um, and it's actually competing there with the top end uh, at that location. So we see one, one hybrid is below average one year and above average the next year. If we look at that Dynagro hybrid, uh, which is that uh, uh, M60 GB31, nearly 6,000 pounds in 2019, so about 1,000 pounds above trial average in 2019. Well, we look at it this year, it's below average by quite a bit. Um, and, and so we're looking at about 500 pounds below trial average this year, one of the lower um, hybrids in, in that yield potential for this year. Uh, so really just didn't, didn't fall into favor this year. And then we look at the Richardson seed, which is the one in green. Um, it's it's kind of right around, right around average, slightly below average in 2019 and, and quite a bit above average in 2020. Um, so we, we, have, we have a couple of varieties here that, that are right around average in both years that Sorghum Partners uh, uh, 31A15, one in, our, one in our Dynagro that did well in 2019 that did not do well in 2020, and then one in our Richardson seed that did really well this year but didn't do well last year. So when we start asking ourselves the question is, is 
what variety should I plant? And, and it's hard to pick that exact variety because of how environment can, can influence these individual varieties here. It, it's a big Im influence and, and I, I always tell folks that I will tell you exactly what hybrid to plant if you tell me when the rain's gonna fall and what's our hottest month gonna be. Um, because that's, that's kind of where we're at. We can't pick the best variety and people that give top five, top tens, I, I feel is almost a disservice because we, we, can't, we can't predict that for next year. We can predict that for this year, but this year doesn't matter anymore. You know, we can't predict that for next year. And, and so what I like to look at is, is those characteristics, where those fit into your system. Because once again, do you want to grow earlys or lates? Do you want to have an open or closed canopy or a head structure? Uh, those open structures do really well if we have something like headworms or aphids get in there because they're very easy to control in a more open head. But they, they often allow for perching potential of blackbirds. Where those closed ones, the blackbirds really can't perch in there and feed but they're, they're, very, they're a lot more difficult to get in there and get good spray into that head if we do get headworms on down later in the season. So very important things to start to, to decide. So when, when somebody comes and, and looks, looks to me for a recommendation, especially down in that more Southwest Oklahoma, that Tipton area, uh, I, I look at the lates and I, I call those, they're a risk for an above average reward. And I chose those words very specifically because it's not high risk, high reward, because we still can get really good yields from our, our lates, even in a year that they don't outperform our earlies and our mediums. However, it's just an above average reward because I actually had to go back to 2017 where the trial average of the lates out yielded the earlies. Um, so so it, it's, it's a risk for some reward if you have a really great hybrid that fits into your system, that's great. But more often than not, I'll recommend an early, early, mid, or true mid, medium hybrid to go in that Southwest Oklahoma. Um, I, I also would, would caution to say a lot of really earlies um, hold similar risk. So we're, we're talking about 57 days to mid bloom or less. Um, because if you have a bad scenario in, in mid June, you can run into an issue to where you just don't have enough days to where it's gonna grow vegetatively to produce enough photosynthetic material to, to really get you enough top end yield potential. So those er, late earlies, early mids, and, and maybe even stretching in some of those mids are, are probably your lower risk ones. So aren't, aren't always gonna break the, break the bin, but they're going to be a, a lower risk, um, more consistent reward scenario. And, and remember that, that a lot of this maturity in those days to mid bloom dates are going to vary based on your planting date. Um, you know, if you plant early, you might want to do a specific day to mid bloom compared to if you're planting later. When's your typical stress period and when you want to harvest? That's very important to know if you want to go back into wheat or not, because that plays a big deal into to what your system kind of is there. And that's kind of leads me into that there's more to the story than just selecting a hybrid is that management influences bulk majority of all this. Planting dates can make these things go, go longer. Um, if, you're, if you're kind of on the later end, you might want to hit a longer hybrid. That way you can stretch vegetatively through that high stress period in July and maybe early August and really catch into grain fill uh, when we get into mid to late August and into September where we actually are getting these rains more consistently. Um, where if you're wanting to go really, really early, maybe an early will get you in and out before those really stressful situations. So at the Tipton location, it's actually one that we plant as early as we possibly can. We start looking at soil temperatures about the first week in April. So that, that does vary some of the data that you're looking at whenever you're looking at, at some of those and so uh, at, at our results. So if you're, if you're planting then, your earliest, uh, earliest varieties seem to start going to reproduct in late May and early June and then your lates are June and July. Um, and then I, I always stress that we need to look at typical management strategies uh, whenever selecting a hybrid because that plays a big deal. So if I were to stand on any rock and say that this is what you should go with, early mid variety, uh, one that's got good cold, cold to cool seed germination and plant as early as you possibly can. Make sure you have enough nitrogen out there to push it. 
Um, but and, and minimize competition because with the earlies, you are going to get less vegetative growth. So you're going to need more help with some of those weed control. And I would find one that's a little better tiller and, and plant a little lighter. Uh, something that has about a one and a half to two heads average per plant is kind of what I would recommend if I were to stand on that. So with that, I'm going to stop here for a second and uh, Bronson's going to play that video uh, for us. One of the other studies uh, related to grain sorghum today that Dr. Lofton is going to talk to you about in just a minute is our grain sorghum stover study. We've been looking at grain sorghum in a dual use capacity for the past several years since about 1415 actually. I've uh, been doing some uh, work where we look at taking off a grain sorghum crop on their grain crop uh, then coming back and utilizing that stover. And part of what we've been doing is looking at uh, not only the yield of the stover, how much we're able to get out of that uh, from a yield standpoint in terms of the forage component, but then also the nutritional value, looking at crude protein, acid detergent fiber, total digestible nutrients, but then also looking at the nitrate content of those uh, stalks once we harvest them. So one of the things that we've decided over the past couple of years that we think it might be of interest looking at some of our past data is that we noticed when we introduce chemical termination, we seem to see a little bit of a difference in the nutritional value and the nitrate content uh, of those sorghum stalks. So what we're going to do in this study is we have four varieties in each in, in uh, two blocks here. One block will be chemically terminated with Roundup. The other block will be harvested and then uh, not chemically terminated. Then we will harvest the stover from those and look at both at yield, nutritional values, and nitrate content. And again, part of the reason that we're look, looking at this on uh, the dual use from a grain sorghum crop is how do we stretch our economics with this crop? Not only can we get our grain yield off of this crop, but then we can utilize it in our cattle operations as another feed source for them and thus increase our economics with this crop. And over the past years, we've sold some positive results with that. Uh, the idea and the concept of using sorghum, sorghum stover like that is not necessarily new, but we've looked at it from the standpoint of having concerns related, related around nitrate toxicity. And one of the things that we found is that uh, in most cases, it's not been nearly as toxic as what we had thought it might be. So uh, we found a lot of favor as we looked at that in, in the potential of utilizing this crop as a secondary source uh, feed with our cattle. So again, uh, Dr. Lofton is going to come in and continue talking about this and the work that we're doing with this grain sorghum crop. Yeah, so I, I do I, I do apologize for not making a video when, when we recorded these down in Southwest. We actually had a, a student that tested positive for COVID, so I was actually in quarantine for the time that they were filming those. But um, but I, I really appreciate Gary giving a great introduction to not only where we've been, but where we're going. Just to kind of fill in some of these gaps. Um, Basically, we, we like to use as much as we can these variety trials as an extra benefit, an added benefit, something that we can look at besides just, just variety performance. And, and one that Gary was looking at, and I kind of, I, I piggybacked on, so bulk majority of the value of this comes from Gary himself is, is looking at the secondary use of sorghum uh, following harvest or even a failed crop. And so we, when we started looking at this, the, the first question that came up is kind of what the true value of it is. And, and so here I have just average crude protein ADF and TDN numbers um, of the trial itself. Now there's a lot of hybrids that go into this. There's some varietal or hybrid difference between these, um, but these were just kind of trial averages for the locations uh, that we were looking at. So I kind of kind of base these off of, of what you know, there, there's so many variables that you can go in to, to determine if this is a decent or not forage. We kind of went with the, the values of if crude protein was around 10, and if TDN was 60, that, that's our thresholds for, for calling it a decent forage or not. You know, we could argue and, and 
those values, but we kind of just stuck on those to, to give some sort of relative basis to it. And if we take a look at that, everything that's marked in green under that crude protein percentage is something that's above that threshold. So we're looking at Tipton in 2017, 18, and uh, 14. Perkins 2017 was a little bit under, not greatly under at 8.8%, but, but you know, is, is kind of right around that value. However, we saw anything outside of Tipton in, in 2018 is, is quite a bit lower crude protein percent. When we look at TDN, it's a little bit more favorable. Perkins 2018 had, had fairly low TDN. Um, we didn't have as many above 60, but we had quite a few that were hanging right around that 60% that uh, TDN on that. Um, I will tell you on one, one reason for that 2018, because you might be asking yourself why tipped in 2018 looked so good. We actually weren't able to harvest a crop. Um, that, that crop failed out that year. And so that is, a, that is a failed crop that we were able to come in and hypothetically get some value to that. And we see when we didn't harvest that grain, the, the, the actual value to that is quite a bit higher, uh, especially when you, when you look at its comrades in 2018, it's about double the crude protein that, that we had in some of our other locations. So the question then becomes like, what is the true value of it? Well, if you have it in your mind what you want, it's, it's not going to be a just a, a glorious uh, forage source that we're, we're looking at. It's, it's short term um, because we, we are looking at a residue that is in the field decomposing. So we know the quality of that will go down greatly over time. By the time you've reached that 45th day, you know, 45 days after harvest, the quality is going to be quite a bit lower. Um, and, and we remember the true use of it. It's, it. It can be used to kind of bridge that gap between our summer pastures and our winter wheat pastures. That's, that's how we have to think about this. Is it a standalone? Probably not, but it's a, it's a good gap closer. That way, if we have some sort of long-term hay reserves and we need to keep those for the winter, we can kind of keep those in the barn um, and, and we can use this sorghum uh, stubble if, if we need to. And it adds that extra benefit to the sorghum crop itself. Um, and then we actually gave a presentation similar to this down at the Red River Crop School and a guy came up to me after and he said that he's never had as good a winter wheat pasture as, as the year he let his cattle run on his sorghum field for a month or two prior to running on wheat, wheat fields. So it is one of those that we can add it to improve the system. Um, you know, everybody that I've talked to says animal condition doesn't improve going on the sorghum uh, field, but it doesn't deteriorate. So it's a good kind of getting it to that winter wheat pasture where, where maybe we can gain a little bit of animal condition, a little bit of weight on the back end. Um, because it is a sorghum, we are concerned about the toxicity of it and nitrate is kind of the, the thing we, we kind of look for. We still have prussic acid and that's still something we need to consider, but because for the bulk majority, this is a dead plant. Prussic acid is probably not as big of a concern as something like nitrate. Um, it, you know, nitrate uptake is a, is a common thing. It's going to happen in sorghums. It's just one that sorghum likes to accumulate it a little bit more. But where we get caught is where the process of converting nitrite to nitrate into a protein gets stalled. And those can happen from various things. Stress is usually the number one contributor but we can also look at a couple of different things. Environmental condition associated with that stress. What stage the crop's on is a really big deal. The plant part, I think most people that run cattle know that that bottom six inches is where we like to accumulate nitrates in the sorghum. And that's one we gotta pay attention to. Did we over fertilize that sorghum crop? Once again, a bigger issue whenever you're talking about forage sorghum than grain. And then the big question mark is how do pests, specifically sugarcane aphids, Im impact the, the grazeability of this? So when we look at, at stress and nitrate um, overall for our grain sorghum, moisture stress is one of the bigger you know, hallmarks for getting nitrate accumulation. Doesn't necessarily always happen, but, but short term stress followed by those rainfall periods are where we look at it in forage sorghum. We don't have that to kind of look at in grain sorghum. What we're more concerned with is long-term stress that left a lot of green material to where we didn't fill that grain as complete as we possibly can. Once again, we all know the bottom half of that sorghum stem is, is more, um, accumulates more of that. The, the more grazable fractions, the leaves, the heads, the petioles are, are less likely to accumulate nitrate, but 
we do know that sorghum stems are a lot more palatable to, to cattle than corn st uh, stover is. So uh, they will get down into that, those corn stems and so, or those uh, sorghum, sorghum stems. So that's something we need to be concerned with. And then if we, if we don't chemically terminate, the regrowth on that is potentially something that we need to be very concerned with because we will get accumulation in, in that regrowth. So this is the data that Gary collected. So we, we grabbed 3,000 uh, parts, uh, parts per billion is that, that kind of that threshold for us, us uh, indicating a, a risk. Um, so this is tipped in 2014 and we're looking at those. Basically nothing even came close. We're, we're mainly under 2,000 for a bulk majority. Uh, you see a lot of these hybrids, not very common. This is fairly old data, so we didn't, we didn't see a lot of it in some of these older, older hybrids. Uh, fast forward to 2017, these are hybrids that we still have into the, the trial into this day. Um, we look at uh, both Tipton and Lahoma location for this one. We saw that that KS585 spiked a little bit in Tipton. It is, was also the only location that had sugarcane aphids that year. So um, this kind of led us to, to believe that maybe nitrate wasn't a big issue in this kind of situation outside of maybe an aphid situation. So that's kind of where we focused our effort then uh, for the next several years. And so this is um, 2018 data, once again, looking at forage nitrate values for KS585. If you're unfamiliar, this is like uh, aphid ice cream. It will bring aphids from miles to come to the, that field. Um, and then DKS 3707 is considered like the stand all for comparing resistance to sugarcane aphid. Really doesn't get affected by aphid all that much. Once again, that 3000 as, as, a, as, a, um, as a threshold, looking at Adams, Oklahoma. So that's out in the panhandle, Lahoma Perkins here near Stillwater and then Tipton. Tipton in 2018 had some issues. It, it grabbed over that 3,000, so around that 33 to 3,500 um, level. But remember, that's also where we didn't harvest that crop. So we had a full alive sorghum plant or kind of alive sorghum plant out there. So if we have something in a filled crop scenario, our quality does go up pretty significantly, but nitrate becomes a, a challenge that we wanna look into. Um, Adams is the only other location that year that spiked over that 3000 threshold. Um, and we thought, oh, well, that's probably when we got the lab data, we're like, oh, that's probably that KS 585 because it had aphids out in the panhandle. Nope, it was the 3707 or 3707. The 585 was still well under that threshold. So aren't really seeing a varietal difference in nitrate uh, accumulation. It's really a stress factor and where you are in that state and basically how that variety handles handles stress. So, um, you know, it is one of those situations that, that um, it, it looks positive because when Gary started this, he was looking for hope. Can we use this? Is there a potential when, when really what he should have been looking for is what's, what are the situations where we can't use it or we should be cautious around it because there was more, more often than not, we found not an issue with the nitrate accumulation. That doesn't mean that we can't test. It's, it still means we need to really, really test, but we're looking for, um, we're looking for hot spots, not looking for areas where we might be able to do it. It's, it's more likely that you will be able to graze the residue and maybe look for hot spots to where you don't want to pin in that area or you want to make sure that they're not, not congregating in, in a particular hot spot. Highly encourage testing both yearly and spatially. Get out across your field like you're taking a soil sample and then really look for critical areas. So these are these areas that you know are stressed, maybe sand blows, top of hills, something like that, that, that can be a really big issue. So kind of look for that. Testing's a, a really big thing. And so to kind of wrap that up, can we use it as a forage? Yeah, it's, it's potential. There's some potential to it as long as we remember what it's used for. It's not a standalone. It's probably not a long-term option, um, but, but we, we can use it within our system. Uh, we just have to be cautious regarding a lot of those management challenges that we have. And so I, I listed two fact sheets. These are what will be definitely be up on the, the website. This is um, our performance trial that we put out every year. It gets re-adapted uh, every year, but the good thing is we have a continually uh, updating source now. Um, so you can go back to 2017 and look at what it looks like. And then we also have me and Gary put together as well as Alex Rocatelli, um, one about potential grazing 
of the grain sorghum has a little bit more discussion on this as well as some of those challenges. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Gary and Aaron and uh, answer any questions if we have time. If, if not, I'll, I'll hang around and we can go on about it. Okay, Josh, you might stop sharing your screen. You know, Josh, I think that uh, I'll, Aaron, if it's okay, I'm gonna jump in with a question here real quick. Uh, uh, one thing that when we looked at those sorghum trials that that uh, tend to stand out to me, and then as you and I talked about it, as we were managing those trials, we managed them for a grain harvest, so we didn't we didn't shirk on fertilizing mm -hmm. uh, with nitrogen out there to be able to make that grain harvest. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that's right. We, we, you know, because Tipton has the potential to go up to that five to 6,000 pounds, we manage nitrogen for that. Um, so we're, we're looking at, at well over a hundred pounds of nitrogen being applied to those plots. And then more often than not, soil tests were called for 40 to 60 pounds of P and K. So yeah, we, we, we managed it for the grain. The forage was just that added benefit on, on the back end. And if you take that in light of consideration of work that was done years ago uh, involved in where we looked at nitrate toxicity and we got beyond that 100 pounds and we said, you know, hey, we can start to see some issues with nitrates at that, at that uh, uh, point out there. That was one of the things that I think that kind of, at least it surprised me. I don't know if it surprised you, but it surprised me that we were looking at the temperature trial where typically we had anywhere from 120 to 135, 140 pounds of nitrogen out there. But what we saw and what really uh, caused that hope to rise in me more so in double using that crop was that, hey, we take the grain crop off out there, everything, we've got a, a stover left out there that we're really not seeing nitrate toxicity issues in. And even in 2018, where we did spike above that 3,000 parts per million, depending on the type of cattle that you're using that in, 32, 3300 still wasn't that bad in a year where we didn't take the grain crop off. Yeah. On it. So, you know, it, it was surprising seeing some of that data to me to uh, see how it responded in in light of previous work that had been, uh, been done. Yeah, and it'll, it'll be interesting this year because we took, we took some of the forage stuff off this year here close to Stillwater, and it was, it was right next door to a, a, our forage sorghum trial. Uh, you know, we had a forage sorghum trial this year that, that we, we chopped uh, the, the sorghum at, at around 55, 60% moisture. So um, it'll be able to look on, on a year like this is, uh, you know, did we have similar nitrate levels in those two or, or is the grain just, you know, looking substantially less than nitrate levels than, than the forage even, even at that. So, because there's, there's some parts of the world last year that spiked really high on nitrates. And, uh, uh, you know, I know a couple of producers we, we talked to sent grain sample or sent forage stover samples in and, and never had high nitrate, but their, their forage sorghum that they were either haying or grazing was, was, was hot in season. So just because the forage sorghum's hot in an area doesn't mean the grain sorghum's gonna be hot either, so. Well, it'll be interesting, and I think the other component that, you know, that we're, we're, we're adding into this that's, that holds some interest is that I think it was the, I think it was in 2017, 2018, maybe it was 16, I'd have to go back and look now, but where we started chemical termination uh, of, the, of the Stover, or of the trial there at Tipton, uh, that I called you up one time and you and I started looking at that data and said, well, now, you know, we're kind of looking at a dip in our quality, but a rise in our in our nitrate. Do we think that gets tied back to the fact that we're chemically terminating that plant and shutting, and shutting down those physiological processes in the plant? So that's part of what you and I decided to take a look at at this standpoint. And, you know, that's an interesting discussion because there's all kinds of advantages to chemically terminating the grain sort of crop uh, out there in terms of uniformity of harvest and management of that crop and and things uh, associated with that, maybe even post or late season weed control, things like that. But do you have another overriding purpose that you also want to consider that you might carry to frost, let frost do the job? And yeah. so 
you know, what are your thoughts when you start to look at that as we enter into this part of the study and kind of say, well, let's compare these two processes and see, does it impact us? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be probably the most interesting thing. And thanks for bringing that up again, Gary, is, yeah, like, uh, chemical termination, especially downstate, is becoming a more, at least in the northern tier, I don't know about down in your area, Gary, but at least in the northern tier, it's becoming almost a, a more standard practice as, as um, not necessarily as an even or as a weed control. It's a, it's time to harvest sorghum, so I need to harvest sorghum. Uh, because I got beans on the back end and I got cotton hanging around and I need to get weed in. So it's a, it's a, it's a farm management decision, not necessarily an agronomic management decision. So um, it's becoming more common. So the question then becomes of, you know, are we, are, are we locking in things in a less palatable, more potentially dangerous situation by, by, you know, making that, that chemical termination. So uh, but yeah, it was 17 where we first terminated that. And, uh, and it, uh, you know, we terminate that trial for the same reason that growers do is, uh, you know, I have a very short time to get down to Tipton to cut that and, and it has to get, it has to get cut. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big decision. Now I will say on the back end, um, if you do have those really wet conditions, that chemical termination might help us out in, in nitrate toxicity if you get that regrowth. Um, because more often than not, if you chemically terminate it, you're going to probably shut down a lot of that regrowth potential. But uh, you know, are, are you damaging the main the main grazing potential more? So, well, and it and it, I think it partially depends what your goal. You know, if you're grain, so you're getting the grain crop out, you got a good grain harvesting crop out there, and uh, you want to take advantage of that, keep that, get it to market, and everything. And you feel like that there that may be in some risk, whether it be weather conditions, environmental stresses, or whatever, or just flat time management on the deal. You've got to consider that in light of what am I going to use that stover for? Do I feel like that stover is really going to be a, a stretcher for me out here in my cattle to get me onto wheat pasture? And I'm trying to manage that as well. And you and I have talked about these these factors too. Some varieties that we're dealing with today have good state green characteristics, like. So we can take a grain sort of harvest off out there and still have some good state green characteristics in those varieties standing in the field when we turn cattle out into them on there mm -hmm. as well. So it becomes a, a little bit of a question of what is your management goal? What are you looking for out there? And, uh, you know, we've approached this, I think, from the get-go is that we're, we're going to take a grain crop off of it. We want to take a good harvest. And, hey, there's, second, there's a secondary use of this crop out here, too, that we want to consider. And, so it, it, I think it's an interesting point that we're going to look at and see what does it do when, on the backside when we're considering the forage quality component of the crop. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Aaron, I'm jumping on your spot here. It's your turn. Oh, no, you're good, Gary. So far, I mean, I don't see anything in the chat box other than what uh, Randy and you posted there at the very beginning. So if there's any other questions at this point, free, please feel free to jump in there. Um, and at this time, I, I, with no introduction, I guess, Gary, we'll turn it over to you. Gary's a, uh, our uh, extension educator in Jackson County um, by day, um, by night. He's our, um, I was going to call you area agronomist, but uh, maybe a row crop specialist for the southern, uh, southwest corner of the state. So, Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Everybody see that okay? It's in slideshow mode. Looks good. Okay. okay. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you uh, for the intro. Um, part of what, or what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, some work that I've been doing with Sesame at the Southwest Research and Extension Center. Oh, several years back when Dr. Randy Bowman was still at the Extension Center, we were heading into a drought, a really drought period there at the, uh, in this area. He and I began to look and to identify what dry land crops that we saw had potential in our area to work with. 
And sesame was one of those crops that we looked at and said, you know, this, this has some good potential in our area. And across time, we've seen an increase in growing sesame and in, an increase in acres across, I think, especially through the west side of the state here. And Josh, I know you're still on, so you feel free to jump in because I know you do work with sesame as well as we go along here. But we've seen that increase there and that interest out there. But one of the things that uh, we've had that uh, come up uh, across time with that questions that I find posed to me is that, hey, I've, I've got a wheat production system and I'm looking at sesame. I want to incorporate it in as a row crop, uh, rotational crop, uh, part of my system, but I'm wanting to plant it after wheat harvest. Do I have any issues when it comes to the herbicide program that I, I utilize in my wheat system? So this study is looking at uh, this is sesame following wheat there, and I'm going to have to move some things around here so I can actually see the top end of my slide. Nope, that's not what I'm after. There we go. This is sesame following wheat, and I call it my sulfonylurea urea plus tolerance uh, study. And so what I'm looking at is some sulfonylurea urea uh, herbicides that have been utilized in a wheat production system plus a couple of others. So the purpose of the study is to determine the residual impact on commonly used sulfonylurea urea uh, and two other herbicides on plant back to sesame following wheat harvest. The study will look at various rate applications within some of the SUs that were included in this trial, all within a label recommendations for those SUs. And then the study will look at residual impact of herbicide on sesame, considering emergence, chlorosis, and stunning of that crop. Okay. Well, for some reason, I'm not moving, Bronson. There it goes. Okay. Um, the herbicides and rates utilized in this study, uh, the sulfonyl ureas, I'm looking at Outrider, it used to be the old, old Maverick that we looked at, but Outrider at 0.67 ounces uh, per acre. I'm looking at Finesse at two rates, 0.2 and 0.4 ounces. Again, both label recommendations within wheat. And then Affinity, uh, which is a short, uh, short residual uh, uh, broadleaf herbicide uh, within wheat at the 0.5 and 1 ounce per acre. And then looking at Ally at uh, 0.1 ounce or a tenth of an ounce per acre in the wheat system. And of these products, the one that I started out, I really looked at Outrider and Finesse and, and wondered, okay, I'm, am I going to see, am I going to see some residual impact or damage to the sesame behind these two products. And those were the ones, maybe even the ally to a degree, but I was concerned about uh, as I uh, uh, picked these herbicides out. The other two herbicides that I've got in the study and involved is Culex. Uh, we've used a lot of Culex in our area down here related to mare's tail control. Uh, Culex is a, a label recommended rate at 0.75 ounces per acre. But I had a request from company on this to go ahead and double that rate at and, and, and an enhanced rate and see if we saw any damage to, against sesame as well. And so uh, in two of the three years I'm showing here, I have it at 0.75 and a double grade of one and a half ounces. And then one year, the first year in 2018 that I'll show you today, we actually had a three ounce rate as well. And then we look at PowerFlex, which is a another uh, herbicide that we commonly used in uh, wheat at two ounces per acre. Of these um, uh, uh, herbicides that are used, I'm going to go into a trial information. I'll tell you that I plan my herbicide application to address kind of broad leaf timing and emergence. So from that regard, the issues, the sulfonyl ureas, with the exception of the Outrider, would be applied about on time there. However, Outrider and PowerFlex would be considered late applications. Those are typically used more in a grass herbicide situation in our weed control. Um, efforts out there, but uh, uh, in PowerFlex's uh, case, we have a really good broadleaf label associated with PowerFlex. So sometimes we'll see that uh, producers hold on and wait for those applications and to see if they get broadleaf so they can try to get both species at, at the same time. And there are years on those grass applications that, that whether we've got a really hard freeze or a dry winter and we don't have good green vegetative growth on those grassy weeds, then we do tend to try to wait and see if we can get some good active green growth to apply them so we get uptake out there. But we typically we'd prefer to see those applied in the fall if we're dealing with grasses. 
But again, we've got those times and scenarios where we do see that coming in late is what we may do with those herbicides, but it's not uh, an outrider and power flexing situation. Those would be considered late applications typically for that. But for the purpose of this trial, I kept them all grouped together and applied at one time. And again, kind of in that broadleaf uh, weed control window. In 2018, we're in that kind of pretty much a timely uh, time period. The last half of February to 1st of March is kind of a time where we'll see some broadleaf herbicides go out in our area down here. And we're pretty much in time on that year. 2019, we were behind on our broadleaf weeds and when they came out and kind of our wheat growth and development was a little slower that year on it. So we were, uh, I'm looking over here at the same time, Mike Schultz, because Mike's got wheat going out. We were behind getting some of that products out. So in terms of wheat growth and development and broadly conversions, we were still okay that year um, in 2019. Now in 2020, we were late in our spray application. Uh, part of the problem is I was had a little trouble getting some of my product in in, time, in timely fashion, but I'd hoped to be out about two weeks prior to that and we'd been close to on time on that, but rain kept us out of the plots and we couldn't get in to put the herbicide down. So in 2020, we were late in terms of getting our application out. In terms of planting dates, you can see those run across typically around the 1st of July is when we come in and planted those. So what we have in terms of an intervals from time of spray to planting the sesame ranges about three to four months is what we've looked at. At the bottom of that, you'll see sprayer info in terms of uh, how many gallons per acre pressure used and the uh, tips that I utilized in this study. Okay, let's look at our trial data. In 2018, actually I heard Misha Manicherry, Dr. Manicherry shared this one time when we were talking about our coaxium uh, data at the tip of the station. Now, it's a little bit boring in terms of fluorosis and stunning. Uh, when we look at that, we did not see, in fact, across the years, I'm going to show you, we really didn't see any chlorotic symptomology in the sesame after, uh, after these products. In terms of stunning in 2018, I really didn't see any stunning issues out there. When I look at the plant populations in 2018, the check plot, which you'll see in the next slide, was at 61,000 plants per acre on that. But none of these uh, treatments showed uh, significant differences between the plant populations. Now, I'd point out that some of the SUs typically, they tend to come in a little bit lower in plant population uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the final plant population, but again, not significantly lower. Uh, the numbers that stand out a little bit to me in this table, the outrider is a little bit lower. Again, we didn't pick up significance with it, but a little bit lower. You can see from that 61,000, we're about, you know, 14,000 below there. Same thing at the Vanessa 0.4. And then you get down to Culex, which is interesting. It's 41.5, uh, where we doubled the rate. But you look at the label rate, we have no damage. But you look at the three ounce rate, we have no damage on it. So a mixed grab back there, and I'm not entirely sure what's happening in that scenario there. Our ally, we saw a little bit of uh, uh, plant population suppression on there, but again, none of those are significantly different when you look across it. And what's that mean is that I'm not confident when I look that day that I won't see different uh, different results in another year looking at that. So again, really didn't see much uh, impact on our plant populations in 18 as well. Here are some pictures. I'm going to advance one slide so I can, we're going to go back through these backwards. I, I made a mistake. I should put my check slide up front on the first slide. But if you look at the picture of the check plot there, this is a picture of the 2018 uh, trial. Then let's head back by Ally XB. Again, a little bit lower plant stand in that, but in terms of stunning chlorosis, no impact whatsoever. You look at the three rakes of Culex up there across there. Sometimes you can see what looks to be like they're not quite as robust appearance as some of the plots, but in terms of true stunning and any chlorotic damage, there was none across any of those uh, uh, any of the treatments. Now let me back up one slide. We look at our affinity, which is our true uh, short residual uh, type uh, herbicide there. We're not seeing any, any damage there at uh, 0.5 uh, uh, or 5 tenths of an ounce application. And I'm, I can see I made a mistake on the affinity that has a one forward slash PC 1.0, the one ounce application. Uh, if you look at the two finesse treatments, again, we're not seeing any chlorotic symptomology, no stunning associated with those. Again, maybe not quite as robust as compared to that, uh, that check plot uh, as far as uh, branching and breadth across there, but 
in terms of true stunning, we didn't see that. Outrider, uh, again, didn't see any symptomology. And then we look at PowerFlex on the outside. That low spot in PowerFlex, we actually had a waterlogged spot right in the back of that plot there. But uh, again, when you look at true stunning fluorosis, we're not, we're not seeing any of that damage with those plots. All right, 2019 trial data. Uh, we come in, and this time I've dropped that Culex at three ounce rate. I've dropped it out, and I've just kept my two uh, two levels of Culex there. Uh, plant populations in 19 are a lot lower. Mike, we had a, we had a struggle that year getting a stand on there. We were we were waiting on enough rain to keep germinating us out there, and we finally got rain to germinate us along. And if I remember right, I'll go forward real quick. Okay, the check plot in this one averaged at 13,800. Again, we didn't see any significant differences uh, between the treatments in terms of plant population. Still see that trend in the issues of a little bit lower population, it seems like out there, but not, not dramatically lower, again, and not significant. I picked up a little bit of stunning in, across some treatments there. Uh, across the SUs and a little bit, just barely any in the QLEX. Didn't see any in the in the PowerFlex, but again, very minor, certainly not significant stunning at all when you consider what's going on. And the Ally this year, the Ally where it was just a little bit lower than 18 on plant population, but jump back up and it's above the uh, check plot this time. And again, no fluorosis or stunning on that. Again, no significant differences in those treatments when we're looking at that plant back situation with this SME on the, at this point. Now, 2010 to 20 trial, and Josh, as you're in there, I want you to really pay, you and I have had discussions around this. I think you're gonna find this interesting. Again, I've been really shocked looking at this because I really expected Outrider and Finesse to catch my sesame, especially at this short residual turnaround time where I've only got three, four months plant back. I expected to see some damage out of that. All right, in 2020, I kind of noticed the uh, the other, was it the other saying the other foot dropped, the other shoe dropped, something like that. And when I look at finesse, my 0.2 and 0.4 ounce rate, I've got significantly less plant population this year. Uh, we It really, really caught us this year and we do have significant differences when it comes to the finesse treatments, they're significantly lower in plant population. Still no chlorosis over there. If you run out over onto the stunning side, the finesse at the 0.2 ounce or two tenths of an ounce rate, a rate, but not very much stunning, but boy, at the four tenths of an ounce rate, we definitely have some significant stunning associated with that. Now, when I look at Affinity and Culex, PowerFlex again, not really seeing any issues out there with that in terms of plant population. Minor issues every now and then with stunning, but again, very minor. And uh, the Outrider did not show um, uh, any plant population decrease in this year either. It was significantly lower than my check. So for 2020, what we saw was that I did see some significant differences in terms of final plant stands out there, but that was directly associated with those finesse treatments. Um, on that. And the stunning, the significant difference I found in the stunning, again, was also directly related to that finesse treatment. So I, you know, when I, well, we'll talk summary uh, comments here in just a minute. Okay, here's a picture of that finesse at 0.2 and 0.4 rates in these plots. Now, well, this is just rep one. And remember, there are, there, are, there are four replications to these trials. And we're just looking at a picture of rep one here. Now those sesame plants that you're kind of seeing right here on that, that's the, the, the sticks and the discoloration, that's not finesse, that was my sesame leaf roller. Uh, they moved in and just totally stripped my plots down in here. On this over here at the finesse 4.0, we just didn't basically didn't have any plants left in this one. But in reps two, three, and four, we had enough that we had across an average, we had a little bit of a, a plant stand with that treatment. But I put those pictures in to show you that the finesse this year had major impact on plants, emergence and plant stand in those plots. And uh, and Dr. Manucherry and I have talked about this too, because our, our, our data has kind of agreed on another study that we're looking at with this past couple of years. We haven't seen much impact uh, from finesse against sesame on that. This year was the first time I've seen this kind of impact and it's kind of set me back as I've, I've sat back and looked at that now. So what are some summary thoughts as I, as I look at this, this study? Typically, no chlorosis was noted and stunning among final plants and 
those plants that I have left in the field was typically very low across all all treatments uh, when I looked at it. So if I got the plants up and got them growing, typically I wasn't seeing impact beyond that point. Now in terms of final plant stand, there are no significant differences between treatments in years 18 and 19 until I get to 2020 when finesse shows a significantly lower stand across both treatment rates for that year. How about our non-issue thoughts around that, our PowerFlex and our Culex? Again, these are, are late application times for these two herbicides, but in light of the, in the nature of the study, to keep them all grouped together in one timing, put them in there at that point. But what I'm seeing is that at labeled rates, it was definitely low across uh, the years. And in Culex, where I doubled it up, I'm still seeing low and no, basically no impact even at those enhanced rates. And that's showing to be true in another study that, that we're looking at as well. Now, with PowerFlex and Culex, we did show a little bit lower uh, plant stance in relationship to the check plot in 2020. But again, it's not significantly lower, it's just a little bit lower. So minor impact there as you looked at, but I'm, I'm trying to pay really close attention as I conduct these studies to say, what differences am I seeing, am I seeing out there? But again, very minor impact in that situation. In general, there is some reduction in plant stands across the SU treatments. It's usually not significant, uh, uh, significantly lower out there, just a, a minor reduction, at least some reduction. Uh, but it's not always consistent from year to year. Prime example would be the ally treatment. One year was a little bit lower than the check plot, next year a little bit higher. So a little bit of convoluted uh, response there as we looked at that. So some minor reduction in plant stand, but not significantly lower uh, when, we, when we consider it uh, in comparison to the check plots out there. And finesse, I made a comment to come in. I felt like I need to come in and address it at the end here to say that finesse, typically showed somewhat of a lower final plant stance across the years. So if I look at 18 and 19, tend to be a little bit lower than the check plot, but clearly noted in, in it was significantly lower in 2020 and it really impacted the emergence and stand in 2020. So when it comes to, uh, to finesse, I'm saying that the response is not very clear cut at this point. It's kind of a convoluted response. I got two years that didn't seem to impact me. I got this year, it really hammered out there so let's see and i think with that i will bring this to an end i'm gonna go up here and stop share on that and then i'll open up uh any questions that anybody might have or comments josh jump in here with me if you got things or thoughts that you want to bring up as we talked about that gary i'm seeing a lot uh, increase uh each year of the sesame being grown on tighter soils that are a little higher in ph uh and they're having good success on it would i see because of that scenario a little bit more reaction or what would your thoughts be on those type of soils as far as uh using those chemicals well, if you've got higher pH, then you do need to be careful with some of your issues. You do need to watch that. Sometimes our issues will hang around a little bit longer in those soils, and uh, you need to be uh, pay attention to that. One of the things when you look at, at uh, finesse in particular and everything is that high pH uh, can cause residual impact to be longer out there, be an issue. Now, most of these issues that we looked at, with the exception of, of affinity, we're beyond the label in terms of, of turnaround time in that. So people need to be aware of that. And typically it, it says you need a longer uh, plant back period to be able to come back in and plant behind these things. But per the nature of our study and the questions we were getting, we came in there and said, all right, let's look at this and see what happens if we, we come behind a wheat crop on that and, and we say we're gonna plant in there, what kind of impact are we seeing? So make sure you pay attention to those labels as you look at that. But, in your do or related to your question, that higher pH definitely need to be aware of that, and that could that could potentially impact that. Yes. Okay, that's kind of what I was. Uh, that's kind of what I thought, or you know, I mean, because I I'm just you know I just have that feeling that it was probably going to be a relationship, even though I'm in, I having decent success raising the crop on those those type of soils that are tighter and higher pH in this county. Are they planting back behind a wheat, a wheat uh, crop in these situations or have they, have they skipped a year and planting back into it? Uh, 
I haven't been quite, I mean, they've moved around the fields enough that I don't, haven't been able to kind of pick up on that part yet. Okay. I know early on, I, they were planting behind the wheat, but right now I, I, you know, they may be doing exactly what you're saying, holding off and then planting for a crop of sale. Okay. But, uh, well, again, yeah. if you give it long enough plant back uh, time in terms of months behind that, then you probably wouldn't expect to see an issue. If they're coming right behind wheat harvest, uh, uh, you know, and plant back in there. That's that's where we. I was getting questions, and companies had interest as well. Is are we seeing impact uh, from these herbicide programs in our wheat crop that year if we plant back to sesame following that uh, that that crop? And that's where uh, where this study was geared towards on it. And again, you know, in our situation, we were we're not seeing some of that, but this is initial work that would be it could be used to address future label issues too uh, around that. But if you are dealing with higher pHs, you definitely need to be aware of that in those scenarios when you're talking about issues going out in the field. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Did we lose Josh up there? No, well, and, and you know, we talked about this being the year, if we were gonna see it, this was the year we were gonna see it. Um, you know, so, uh, cause did you talk about the, the residue, the the difference folks have seen between like residue and till? And oh, that's that? a good point. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. We're obviously planting behind a wheat crop. We're planting into, we're planting into high residue out there. Um, I'd had report, I've never seen data around it, but I've ha I had report uh, from uh, some folks in, uh, down in Texas to where they were planning into clean tilt situation. I don't know, and what does clean tilt mean if they're following a wheat crop on there? They went out and they plowed that area and, and, and tilled and worked that residue in and then planted into it. I'm not sure what that means, but where they had finesse out and they did see some injury in that situation down there. But Josh and I have batted that around up here in this year where I'm playing directly into residue uh, behind that wheat crop. I, you know, for two years there, I again, just, you know, not seeing a whole lot of damage behind finance. But this year, different story. Now I would say, you know, I have a 2017 uh, year too where I've looked at this as well. I didn't include that data because the plant population, we had so much rain in 17. It, Plant population data is really kind of hard to explain what's going on. I'm not totally sure I totally understand what's happening with it. But in terms of chlorosis and stunning, same type of scenario from 17, 18, and 19. But again, in 20, we picked up a totally different picture. And in terms of finesse, to me, that makes that a little more convoluted when I'm starting to look at that and say, oh, well, I was beginning to think, well, maybe there's not an issue, but no, now it's backed me up some that I think we've got to be really, you know, we've got to be cautious in considering that. And certainly like in Dan's situation, we're talking higher pHs, we definitely need to be, uh, need to be cautious of that. Now, the other thing I think you talk about, you look at your PowerFlex, you look at your uh, Culex, um, Outrider shocked me, and even Outrider this year still not showing um, uh, uh, any impact on the sesame as we follow behind it. So, um, it's that has surprised me in some of this, especially with just a three to four month turnaround time from spring to planting. But uh, that's also why we'll we'll keep doing this work and see do we see any differences as we keep going with it. Josh, well, were you surprised about the finesse as you as you heard it? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I I think I'm with you. I'm I'm a little surprised with the outrider still. Um, you know, we thought when we first did Sesame, the, the trial we looked at was looking at it double crop behind canola and wheat. And all the times that we put it behind, we put it behind PowerFlex wheat, right? right. And uh, the first year we did it, we didn't get great stands of Sesame behind the wheat. And we thought, well, it was a PowerFlex issue. Um, well, when we did it the second year, we figured out that it wasn't a power flex issue. It was 60 bushel wheat residue and us trying to get sesame into that 60 bushel wheat residue. So we weren't getting the stands, not anything to do with power flex, but especially if growers are really new at planting a small seeded crop like that into really heavy residue that, I mean, the stands just might not be there because you didn't get good seed soil contact and stuff like that. Planted it too deep, 
it's too cold, you know, those other things. So, and um, that's all very, uh, very important, especially in high, re high residue like it. You got to, with that little seed, hairpinning becomes a major issue. You got to really make sure you're slicing through that residue so you don't bounce that seed back out right on the soil surface because you're not putting it deep to begin with. You really only want about three quarters of an inch into, mo into the moisture layer as it is. Yeah, and and we're we're here. We've heard a lot of a lot of stuff around for. I mean, no no variety company or anybody in between. We can't find the logic of just you know poor stands this year. And yeah, um, we're we're looking at uh, based. We got a lot of samples, and we're we're looking at, at germination not being the issue. Um, you know, we did some, we did, we took some growers samples that, that they felt like had bad germination and, and at least as far as we can see, the quality of the seed has not been the issue. It's not like cotton was like two years ago to where we had bad quality seed and we just had bad germ. They, they've all had good germ. What we're evaluating now is, is both sides of the spectrum. How does, how does a lot of these varieties germ in colder soils? You know, because the critical soil temperature for sesame is very high. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's 70 or so degrees soil temperature. So it's fairly high. It's, it, it will be after cotton, you know, after you plant cotton. And then we're also looking at, at how, how it germinates in soils that are 90 and 95 degrees, because we've had some folks think that, that just, they weren't getting as good of a stand and that oil seed going into 95 degree soil temperatures. So um, we'll, we'll see that that data, it takes a while. We started doing that trial in July and I looked at the board today and uh, we will be finished around Halloween. So they've been running seed in germ chambers every week for, uh, I think we've had to replace two germ chambers now because they broke down. So we've, we've been going, I mean, we'll go nearly five or six months of running those things at varying temperatures. So we're going to run sesame from, uh, I think, 55 degrees soil temperature all the way to 105 degrees soil temperature to see where that, that, there's a bell curve in there. We just need to see where it is and if it changes via the variety. Do you think it dinged it a little bit more this year like it did all the other crops that were summer times because of the cool nighttime temperatures. I mean, even the grasses, several of the crops that we had, I mean, didn't really get the Bermuda grass and all those this year didn't uh, take off quite the way they normally would because of the cool nighttime temperatures. I mean, I, I don't know down in, down in y'all's area, but like by the time most of our guys were going into Sesame, we weren't, we weren't at that stage any longer. Uh, we were we were up in it. I'm I'm more under the the issue that we've had some really bad crusting issues this year. Um, I think crusting and and if you've planted canola, you planted sesame, you've done it. Crusting is a major issue with a small seeded, especially a small seeded broad broadleaf because it does it just doesn't have the power to to push it through, and especially with the seeding rates we're wanting to push. So. Um, I, I think we had some crusting issues this year. Um, I think we went in into two wet soils and we slimed it in a little bit and that, that caused some bigger issues than we, than we thought it did. Um, we, we can get rid of that in corn and we can do, get over that in cotton and, and, and Milo because of the way, how much power it has to push through that. Sesame is not a crop you can get rid of, of slime in it in. It, it, is, it is not a crop. You need, you need to wait those extra two days. Uh, and, and that's what I tell folks. So I, I think we had some issues of a lot of first time growers into some conditions that were excessively sub, suboptimal. I don't think, this is actually the first year we don't have sesame in the field because I fell the same traps that a lot of growers did. I, I planted three times and I didn't get a, a, a research stand there. I, I couldn't get it. I could, I got, my last one was probably good enough. If I was a producer, I would have kept it, but not a research stand. So I, it, it was, it, this year has probably been the toughest year for, for me to get Sesame established. I've, the, the amount of time it took Sesame to come out of the ground, your weeds would be an issue. And then Sometimes you just never would get to stand via the pigweeds being the issue or the crusting or soil temperature. I, I don't know. 
but it's this has probably been one of the toughest years to get a good stand of sesame going. And Jared, I, I don't know if Jared, if you're still in line, if you have any comments of around. Yeah, I'm still in the line. Um, yeah, we saw the exact same thing um, that you were stating. Uh, we saw a lot of sesame got planted a little bit too wet. Um, and what we saw really a lot this year that kind of enforces that is we had guys that planted into what we thought were marginal conditions and it came right out of the ground. So um, pretty much along the same lines of what you were saying, Sesame does not have a lot of push, especially as we are pushing these planting rates down and we're encouraging guys to, to keep dialing those planters back and get more precise with it. Um, we got to start looking more towards a, a better planting window. Um, and maybe waiting a day or two, um, the other thing that we're, and it's really hard to get a lot of growers to do this, that, that we are encouraging and some guys are coming around too quicker than others, um, is planting a little bit deeper. Um, inch to inch and a quarter, um, it seems to, seems to be working for a lot of guys a lot better than just trying to put it in shallow. A lot of guys think that it won't come up that deep and it dries out and then we get it all up after the next rain. But, um, a lot of guys are just afraid to put sesame far enough in the ground and that brings on a, a whole host of other problems. But this year was a exceptionally tough year to get a stand across the board. Jared, do you still feel like though in those were tighter soil conditions that, that uh, you know, maybe in a no-till situation where we got a little more soil structure up top there, but do you feel like that uh, we still need to watch that plane depth in a tight soil condition though? In a tight soil condition, it's not as critical, um, but in no-till, it's definitely critical that we go about an inch deep. Um, what we see when we try to shallow it up any more of that is we just get so much hairpinning that we don't actually cut through the residue and we don't place right. the seed. So, um, going that extra quarter inch deep makes a big difference. Which goes goes back to that thing. We can't be creeping on soil temperatures, you know, because even that extra quarter to half inch deeper, that it's going to be colder, you know, wetter and colder. So that's uh, most yeah, of our planting still... of sesame in this area is going to happen, you know, I'd say late May into June, uh, easily, and in, in, in even into late June uh, at times. Uh, you mentioned earlier, a lot of times it comes after cotton. You know, we get we get that in, then we they'll jump in and try to get their sesame rolling. But you know, in June is typically when we see ours ours planted down here on it. So yeah, and as far as what we kind of view as is the best planting time, you know, we we still have some guys that push early. You know, and three or four years ago, that was the whole idea on sesame. You know, push the push yields. You got to be in early, 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 and now. Uh, most of our higher yielding sesame or most of our more experienced growers are going that last week of May up to about the 10th of June. Um, backing it up by about three weeks does get us the warmer soil temperatures, gets it out of the ground a little quicker, but more importantly, it gives us that other three weeks to spray another burn down, um, clean up some weeds ahead of sesame. So I really like to wait till soil temperatures are steadily 70 um, and rising. So that last 10 days of May, first 10 days of June seem kind of the sweet spot. Now I will say this, where I planted late at uh, nearly the first of July on this study and everything, and some of that's related to when we get harvest done and things like that, and we're able to get into that field. But where I've capitalized on rains that have come in there, not a lot of large rains at times, but enough rain to get that sesame up and growing. Once I get it established, it's a pretty tough crop and hangs in there even through some drier conditions on it. Uh, uh, with it. So, Jared, the only thing that wasn't tough enough to endure this year was that was that sesame leaf roll. That's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, those leaf rollers are, they are bad news when we get them. So, Aaron, I'm going to turn it back to you. I went ahead and ran the poll and put it up there. So, yeah, I seen that, Gary. And I, I think by RS already getting that report, it looks like that um, most everybody's already filled that out, I guess. Yeah, so, it's, that's uh, the end result. Yeah. So, um, with that, I don't have anything else. Don't mean to, I mean, we have a few minutes I'll actually on the schedule. If anybody else has any questions or any other comments, please feel free at this time. So uh, other than that, Gary or Josh, or um, got any more updates or any more comments, feel, please feel free. Appreciate everybody coming and 
and um, and they're joining us for the last, on the third day, anyways. So, uh, is Mike in there with you, Gary? He is. Yes. So, does Mike have anything else he'd like to add to? I kind of forget get Mike's there because I don't see his name on the computer screen, but I know he's he's attending as well. So. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. He said he's good. All right. Well. I, nobody else has nothing. Thank y'all. Thank you, Bronson.